the last time I gave this presentation was a conference called Identity North in Vancouver, BC, to a, a largely Canadian crowd who believe they're the world leaders in SSI. So, uh, and I told them, I said, I'm coming over here to talk to the Europeans who think they're leading the charge. Um, the only thing I'll admit, even publicly on tape, uh, is that I don't think the United States is leading the charge. We're not that far behind, but we're not progressive enough as a country right now. Um, <clears throat> so I do, you know, but nipping both your heels is New Zealand. New Zealand wants to not only implement against this, but have a national trust framework that uh, is, you know, more progressive than the current pan-Canadian pan trust framework. And, uh, and, and one of the key people down there co-chairs the Sovereign Governance Center Working Group with me. So I'm getting a, like, every two-week update on what they're doing down there. And their, their national trust framework is going to be in the national legislature. They want it out this spring. So, uh, so the progress we're making here in terms of the adoption of SSI is encouraging. My particular presentation is going to address one issue right here, you can see it on the screen, interoperability. Okay, the challenges we have about interoperability. And uh, I, I, I probably don't need to be the one sitting here telling you that is one of the major challenges we have right now. It's tremendously promising technology, tremendously promising adoption paths, use cases, even business models emerging, but interoperability is gonna be a, a major challenge. So. I'm going to talk primarily about that. Christopher, I think, is then going to talk about a whole bunch of other related issues, and, and uh, <clears throat> hopefully it all adds up, and then Oscar ties it together and gives us all the answers, and we're done. <laughs> all right, um, let's dive into this. I, just a little bit of background. I'm mostly just here to say I've been working on the Internet identity for over 20 years, and I want to be done in the next couple of years. I want this to finally be the breakthrough, and I really really do believe that we can be there. Now, I've been working on a whole bunch of in, in different standards uh, groups, and we're gonna talk about some of those standards that are emerging here for SSI. I also wear a, a, a number of different hats, and I'm gonna be speaking from almost all of these. At Evernim, I'm what's called Chief Trust Officer, so I actually work directly with Evernim customers about the, uh, well, what you'll see here, the governance part of the stack, right? The hardest problem, I would argue, beyond the technology. <clears throat> At the Sovereign Foundation, I'm one of the trustees, and I chair the Governance Framework Working Group, uh, or now co-chair with uh, Emily Fry from Matter in New Zealand. Um, and that's where, again, we've been doing a lot of work on the governance piece of the stack. Um, and then down at the bottom of the stack, Christopher and I and, and a few others are here this week in Amsterdam for a face-to-face -face meeting of the W3C DID Working Group. And uh, that's the other piece that I've been working on for a very long time. I'm not going to go deep into DIDs in today's presentation, but we can happy to do that in, in the discussion if, if that's helpful, if that, that's where you have questions. Um, and Marcus, where are you, Marcus? So Marcus and I are two of the three editors on the, uh, of that. So Marcus and I have been working on similar technologies for a very long time. So I think it was, it's, I was thrilled when I found out, hey, all of us are going to be here, able to be here for this, this meeting together. Uh, so again, Evernim, I... I often have to explain to audiences right up front to make it clear. Evernim's a commercial, we're a pure SSI company. That's all we do is help, help develop that infrastructure. Um, Evernim did the original code for what's now the Sovereign Ledger run by sovereign stewards around the world, okay? And then the Sovereign Foundation, Evernim contributed that, then the Sovereign Foundation in turn said, let's be part of a larger blockchain community, and that was contributed uh, to Hyperledger, where it became the Hyperledger Indie Project. Since that happened, this is two and a half years ago, it spawned uh, the Ursa project at Hyperledger, which is a shared crypto library that was based in large part on the, on the sovereign crypto code, I mean the Indie crypto code. And then the Hyperledger Ares project is the third project that came out of that, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So all three of those Hyperledger projects are um, closely associated, associated with what we're doing here. I think I'll make it clear pretty quickly, though, that where we're going here with this trust of IP stack is not Hyperledger or Sovereign specific at all, okay? It can work with every modern blockchain out there. Ethereum, Bitcoin, um, Christopher's gonna show you some really cutting edge things going on with, with Bitcoin. So permissionless, permissioned, public, private, it should all work. So, <clears throat> 
we have a pretty sophisticated audience in SSI here. When I was talking in, at Identity North, I was, it was the other end of the spectrum. There are a lot of folks that were more on the policy, regulatory, uh, business side of it. And um, uh, what I'm going to show you here really can apply to either audience. So maybe we'll be a little bit more technical here. <clears throat> but I am still going to start out with just making sure we're all on the same page about the basics. Okay, and These two key standards that are involved in the stack. And I know you've, you're familiar with them all, but when I have to explain these to audiences, <clears throat> I start with this very simple universal analogy. We were talking about it at lunch, okay? <laughs> This is self-sovereign identity. It's just not digital, okay? And when I say self-sovereign, what is really sovereign here? It's the piece of leather I'm holding in my hand. I'm the sovereign for it. I actually own that piece of leather, okay? Someone were to take it from me, I could you know, go to uh, civil court and sue them, right? And it would be a criminal act. Um, I don't own the credentials inside of that. They're actually loaned to me by the various issuers and they can revoke them. Right? They can't actually physically take them out of my wallet, but they could revoke that credential as being current. So <clears throat> the point is, I control it. There's no one authoritative issuer of those credentials in the world, and anyone can verify them. Right? And I'm the one who decides what goes in the wallet and what comes out of the wallet. But I have to qualify for a credential, and every verifier that I want to show a credential to be it a TSA at the airport or a, a hotel clerk or an automobile rent, they decide their policies for what they accept. Okay? Now, I know you all know that. I just <laughs> I want to make sure it's clear. We're not trying to do anything different in, in self-sovereign identity infrastructure other than make that work all digitally. And that's, that's not a trivial job, but it's also, in the end, the technology portion, once you're done, doesn't solve the whole thing. For example, the, 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 the credit cards I have in this wallet, I try to notice I don't put the credit card in the, in the open window there. <laughs> um, they don't work and get me, uh, you know, my, my restaurant meal paid for last night because the piece of plastic and the mag stripe happens to work in a machine. What makes it work is a rule book about this thick and a trust network that's been built all around the world with one of the best known brands in the world, right? So that's the other half of what has to happen here and we'll stress throughout the this, this stack. So the two key standards involved with making this work, first one, verifiable credentials. You've all seen this, what we call the trust triangle of the issuer. Let's see if this is all, whoops, hit the wrong thing there. Back up, back up, back up, back up, back up. Okay, wanted to point that way. The issue of the credential, okay. Now, I, I know this, I'm, I'm just gonna take out one credential here and put the wallet down for a minute. I've twice done this presentation, walked away from my wallet at the end, so <laughs> remind my, myself not to do it. Now, I, I guess I can't walk, walk over next to the camera, but I w I'm just making sure it's clear. So the physical credential, I actually had to get a new one a couple weeks ago because I'd filled up my passport book. It takes two visits in person to a U.S. passport office. You can't even do it in one in-person visit. Um, issuer is the one who decides I qualify for this credential. They issue it into my wallet, okay, there, and then I go to the airport, show it to the verifier. They verify this credential in various ways. In, in the U.S., you actually hold it under a blue light machine to make sure it's got the right insignia. <clears throat> if we were to convert that into a digital process, the, the way um, John Jordan from BC government puts it is literally the same database that prints this credential can add another printer driver and produce the cryptographic equivalent, okay? Rather than handing me go in my wallet, I can scan a QR code with my phone, literally standing right there. There could be a poster sitting at the uh, um, US passport office. I could scan that QR code, accept the connection, and they could give me the credential, okay, in person. That's exactly where we hope that, that it goes. And by the way, there are state driver's licenses, we call them DMVs, Department of Motor Vehicles, in the US, where we're already having that conversation. We're showing them examples of how this can work. I'm not saying they're about to do it, but they're, they're at least starting to get ready to consider it. <clears throat> so the holder would then present the credential to any verifier. Well, it's obvious how we do that physically today, but 
in, in, virtually, it's going to happen in a number of ways. The most common one you see in demonstrations is the verifier puts up a QR code, which has what we call the proof request in it, or presentation request, and you scan it. The wallet, the, what we call the agent for the wallet on your phone, reads the request and says, looks at the have or don't have, and if you're going to decide you're going to, if you have what's necessary, it just presents you with that consent request right there. Do you consent to provide this information to the verifier or not, right? So when you think about it right there, it's this is the wallet. In the real world, I'm the agent. I make these decisions. I decide, you know, do I have the credentials that are needed or not? All we're doing in the digital version is putting the agent on here and the wallet on here, hopefully in the secure element. And now the agent will process the request and present it to me. And I will say whether I, I'd like to do it or not. And one of the things I like to point out about that is uh, the Canadians have huge, we had a whole session um, um, there about consent. It's a very big part of GDPR, data protection regulations around the world. Self-sovereign identity infrastructure Okay, a little bit like uh, you know the the seat belts we now use in our cars. A lot of cars won't start if you don't just put you know you don't connect the, the seat. Belt. You just build it in. So that's that's the way I like to uh, talk about the consent portion. Okay, now I'll keep these things here. <clears throat> in the middle, we've got the verifiable data registry. Okay, um, that's the formal term in the in the specification for <laughs> verifiable credentials. Um, but a lot of folks turn around and answer, okay, in this whole thing, what actually does the blockchain do? What is, what is that role? So the next slide, we'll go a little bit deeper into that. Um, and this, again, for non-technical audiences or, 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 or lay audiences, this is as, as deep as I go in the technology. I think here you, you can go a little bit deeper. <clears throat> but, as, again, we're just drawing the trust triangle there. And, and basically what it comes down to is the issuer of the credential is the one that needs to write a DID, not necessarily to a public ledger, but the bottom line is write it to a ledger that all the verifiers that they need to address are gonna be able to access, okay? Now for credentials that you want widely uh, verifiable, it'll be a public ledger, like the, you know, something that's available over the internet that anyone can get to, okay? It's the issuer that needs to do that because the issuer's DID will be in that credential. That's what the verifiers are gonna trust, okay? That's, that's that line up there. <clears throat> Once they've done that, of course, the issuer, that, that DID and the DID document that goes with it is available through the DID method uh, that's used for that particular blockchain, which means when we get to that step, any verifier is gonna be able to look it up and verify the public key that was used um, in, in the key pair that signed the credential. So the issuer does that. At that point, the issuer is now ready to sign any credential that they issue. There's nothing in that process that involves the blockchain, okay? When the, the uh, holder presents that to a verifier, the verifier needs to verify, unless they've cached it or they have some other policy where they already know the public key, they will use the DID and the credential to look it up, literally the DID is the address of that did doc on the blockchain, get it back, get the public key, there's also some other artifacts, depending on the particular did method, that they may need to look up on the blockchain, and then they can verify the proof of that credential. So what I'm trying to make clear here is the role of the blockchain is essentially decentralized key management, or decentralized PKI. This is one of the rare times where I have Christopher Allen here who helped, uh, oh helped, started the rebooting web of trust conference, and the very first one, which was 15? Five years ago, okay. Whatever that adds up to. I guess that was 2015, right? That first conference in San Francisco had, um, and it was the first time I met them all, we had um, Vitalik Buterin, Greg Maxwell, Peter Todd from Bitcoin, and Juan, yeah, Juan, Juan Bennett. They were all there. It was about 55 folks, it was amazing. I don't think a lot of, some of the folks in the room like me barely understood who was in that room, but they all came together because the idea that we could reboot the web of trust, the original idea with PGP and Phil Zimmerman 25 years later, and that the problem blockchain could solve is really this one of 
how do we do decentralized key management, right? Decentralized PKI in a way that would be dramatically simpler and more scalable than what Phil Zimmerman came up with of us all signing individual keys. That was the breakthrough. And it was recognized in that room such that we wrote, what, five papers coming out of that, but the largest group got together on the paper called Decentralized PKI. DPKI is what we call it now. You can still, I hand out a reference to it about once a week. That's, and, and that was the original Rebooting Web of Trust Conference. If you're not familiar with it, the papers submitted to that conference, which are all available on rebooting, re, webobtrust.info. And the next one coming up in Buenos Aires is nine or 10? Number 10. There are like, I think it, it averages out to like 50 papers that have been submitted to every one of those. It's one of the deepest troves of information about um, all of what we call SSI today. <clears throat> so that's the key point there, that that's, that's what blockchain solves. It has nothing to do directly with cryptocurrency, okay? That might be involved in how that, you know, the incentive mechanisms for that particular blockchain, but well, we'll talk about it in a minute. Any blockchain that supports the ideas can support this infrastructure, okay? All right, just a couple more points before we build the stack. The first one, when I talk to audiences that are very familiar with identity systems, and especially federated identity, is there is no integration needed here at all. No verifier or relying party uh, or service provider in the various things needs to be able to be integrated directly with any issuer. That is dramatically different architecture than federated identity today. That's where the light bulb goes on for folks that are in traditional IAM. That doesn't mean that they're divergent paths. In fact, it means just the opposite. It means systems that today use OpenID or SAML-based or OAuth-based federation or SSO, they can have this layered on top of them. And Evernim is working with a number of customers, and that's exactly what they want to do. Uh, in British Columbia, that's been leading out in this, commissioned a public project, uh, an open source project to do uh, integration with uh, Keycloak, uh, the standard um, um, federated SSI support in, uh, in Red Hat uh, and their uh, OpenStack. <coughs> um, it's all publicly documented, available. They're using it now internally at the, at the government of British Columbia inside uh, digital services to log in and authenticate employees. All right, so they're actively using it in production now. <clears throat> okay, so next point. There are different approaches to the second thing that I'm, I'm going to talk about here, which is we haven't shown any relationship necessarily between the holder and a blockchain. So one option here is for the holder to have a DID on a blockchain or multiple DIDs on a blockchain, whatever it is. And that's how once a credential is issued to the holder, if that also has the DID for the holder in it, that's how the holder can prove to the verifier by digitally signing the proof that it's really their credential. It hasn't been loaned to someone else, okay? That is one approach to solving that problem. The other approach that's being used is this one, which is, uh, what we call peer dids, that when this relationship is established, and there's a protocol for doing it called the peer did protocol, it's still based on DIDs, it's still based on did documents, but they don't touch a blockchain. They are, they are exchanged directly between the two wallets. And that, that, that ceremony uh, is, if any of you remember Bump back in the early days, the equivalent today would be either one of us opens our wallet there's a QR code that's generated, the other one scans it, and now the connection is made. That would happen directly. It wouldn't even touch the internet. It's gonna happen, you know, it could happen on a, a you know, Bluetooth uh, or, or NFC directly between those devices. <clears throat> so, peer dids, again, they're real dids, they're just not on the blockchain, and they're pairwise. So, it, when this uh, credential was issued here, that would be one relationship. When uh, the holder first connects with a verifier, it's going to be another relationship. Those never need to be shared outside of the, the scope of that relationship. They're entirely private, pairwise, and once they're issued, the connection that's created is forever. There is no intermediary involved in that connection, and there never needs to be, okay? There's no social network, there's no ISP, there's no one in the middle of that. That connection can be used now by those two parties for everything they want to use it for, for the rest of time. 
The only ones who can break that connection is either one of the two parties. They can delete it, but no one else can. And if there are any marketers in the room, that's usually when they start to wake up and go, wait a minute, wait a minute, what is that? That's a marketing benefit, right? This is, this is where we should be talking to CMOs out there as much as we're talking to CIOs and CTOs, okay? <clears throat> so if you have these two pairwise relationships, then there's a different way you can issue credentials to holders that don't involve a DID. It involves using zero-knowledge cryptography and the holder having a link secret that um, is shared with the issuer. I'm not going to go into the details right now. You can read about that all online, or we can discuss it later. But I just want to point out, these are both the options for how you bind the credential to the holder so they can prove that to the verifier. Now, those of you that are deep into authentication, we had a uh, conversation at lunch. Well, how do you actually prove the holder is there? It's, a real, it's, it's, it's the you know, person to whom that credential was issued. I mean, what if they just hand their phone to someone else, right? Now you're getting down into higher level step up authentication where you need to prove a biometric or a password or even liveness um, detection. Evernim has uh, customers of financial services industry that are already, they have liveness detection in some of their existing products. They want to bind it into an SSI wallet. So you can go all the way up to LOA4 in the old US um, NIST standard of authentication. So authentication in SSI, very active topic. We're not going to go deep into it here today, but I just want to make sure it's covered there. All right, so I have one more point to make here, and then we'll build up the stack, and you'll see the, the overall interoperability picture. The role of governance frameworks. So in this trust triangle, again, the one that works for all of these, you don't have to look much further than the credit cards in there to know, well, how did they solve the problem of any merchant in the Visa or MasterCard or Amex network knowing about every bank that could issue a card, right? Those merchants don't all have a list sitting in front of them or even on the machines right there. The way they solved it is by adding a second trust triangle. We call it the governance trust triangle. The issuer, in that case, we call the governance authority. Now, this suggests that there's one way to implement this that is scalable and is secure. It uses the same technology, which is they could literally create this governance framework that says, this is how this trust network is going to work, and issue verifiable credentials to all the authorized issuers. OK? And if you want to see specifically, well, how would that work? Well, <clears throat> let's say that is MasterCard network. They issue that to every bank who in turn issues the cardholders are now able to take those and get proof, proof of authors, proof of payment to any merchant in the network. <coughs> That's exactly how it works from a trust network standpoint for several of the largest trust networks in the world today. They happen to be payment-based networks, but the identity component and the trust component is handled. <coughs> yep, by all means, take pictures, but we're going to make sure everyone has a copy of this presentation. If uh, is it, yeah, and if. If you it'll, be on the website. it'll be on the website. Excellent. Yes. And we published the same presentation at Identity North last week, although I think you had to go to the conference to get it. But in any case, these are all wide open slides, um, and, and we want anyone to have them. So the point I want to make about this is, first of all, um, it scales. Secondly, today, if you want to put one of these together in the offline world, it's a lot of work it will take you decades to establish something that can really scale and which, where everyone can cooperate together. With SSI infrastructure, anyone can be a governance authority. Any, obviously, existing authorities like governments or consortia or large companies, but so can smaller companies, so can startups, so can uh, churches or you know, uh, uh, community boards or any, anyone anywhere who wants to create a trust network all you have to do is what I call the three Ps. What's your purpose? What's your principles? What are your policies? And what it comes down to is, what credentials do you need to issue? Who are going to be the issuers? And what are the policies under which they're going to issue them? You define those things, and you define them in a paper old document that humans can read. That's all verifiers need to know, because the rest of the infrastructure for delivering those credentials in an interoperable way to those verifiers is going to be in place. So the big part of the problem becomes the squishy human stuff. 
How do they make those trust decisions? And it comes down to governance framework. So uh, another way to visualize this is when you think, hey, it's all about the credentials, it's true. But for every credential that's going to be interoperable with any large group, the other half of the coin is the governance framework behind that, right? This only means something because the US government has another big thick set of rules that happen to correspond to the international rules for passports. Okay, that's what makes for the network. So the governance frameworks, I would say, as we get the technology part solved, are the harder part of the problem and the part that we need to focus on. <clears throat> All right, now the last part of what I'm gonna do here is just say, if those are the basic elements of SSI, if we wanna tackle the interoperability problems, we basically have to go layer by layer and figure it out. So what, we're gonna sh what I'm gonna show you here is what we started calling about a year ago the SSI stack. And um, my key point here is, other than the standards we're talking about, we want it to be as neutral, and the whole point is how do we get interoperability between all of the technologies and, and players we're talking about at different levels. Layer one is anything that uses a DID method and serves as a, what we call a DID registry in the spec, okay? And the reason that can be interoperable is exactly the reason we're here in Amsterdam. It's the DID uh, specification from W3C, all right? We won't go into long history of how long, uh, you know, Christopher has been there, Mark has been there from the very outset of the idea of DIDs. And in fact, um, well, that, I don't have one right here on this, on this slide, but the whole idea of a did method, which is the thing that follows the first colon, was Christopher's insight. How can we have something that'll be interoperated across all these different blockchains and, and, and distributed uh, uh, ledgers, uh, distributed database systems? Every did method, <laughs> has a specification behind it and code behind it that says, regardless of what's happening there, you give a resolver the DID, it will bring back what we call the did document. And that's what makes it interoperable, okay? And I never expected that thing to go all the way to a full W3C working group. I was like, do we really have to do that? But you need to understand that when it got to W3C and when it got up to the technical architecture board, they had never gotten behind any identifier in the history of the W3C other than an HTTP or HTTPS URL. They basically said, use them for everything. And they actively opposed efforts, and I was part of one of them, to, to get behind anything else until DIDs. Why? Because they are cryptographically verifiable identifiers that do not require a central registry. And that was how the Technical Architecture Board and Tim Berners-Lee himself said, we need to get behind this. We need to bring cryptography and decentralization into the W3C and start to standardize it. So <clears throat> that's why this base layer is so important. And I want to emphasize, uh, even though, yes, I'm, uh, I'm associated with uh, Sovereign, I've been helping bring it up as a public permissioned option at layer one, it's only one option. There's another one very optimized for, um, a verifi for, for SSI and verifiable credentials. Totally different. It's got a different um, governance infrastructure. It's a JSON LD based um, registry. Bitcoin, Ethereum. There are over 40 DID methods now registered with the W3C with an informal registry that the Credentials Community Group, which Christopher co chairs, it's available to anyone. Okay. I would have guessed when we started that maybe there'd be 10 methods by now, right? And they're coming in like at the rate of almost one a week right now. So I think this is gonna be very robust, and all it comes down to is you choose your root of trust as an issuer or as a holder, and verifiers decide if they trust it at layer one. This is where public roots of trust, that's why we st stress it's gonna be public ledgers, because when you go up to layer two, that's where we need universal interoperability of all the wallets, and all the, uh, uh, <clears throat> all the interactions between them. And I like to point out, now I'm, I'm gonna switch over to this wallet. I'm pretty sure everyone in this room has a smartphone. I'm not even, if you don't have one, I'm not gonna ask you to put your hand up. <laughs> all right. Now, please put your hand up if the wallet you have on that smartphone is interoperable and works everywhere with everything. Yeah, I keep waiting for the, Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> the reason Andre could almost do that is he has an SSI wallet on there. 
I was referring to the one that comes with the phone. Okay, right. My point is, I, this happens to be an iPhone, you have Google phones, we all have actually very sophisticated wallets that are on these devices. And I wanna make it crystal clear. How would you feel if you bought one of these and you could only put MasterCards in it, right? Or you could only put your student ID in it and maybe a coffee card, but nothing else, right? Proprietary wallet is like saying, oh yeah, I've got a bank account here, and by the way, you can never move your money anywhere else, right? That's what we have on these devices today. They're incredibly powerful and sexy, and they're proprietary and locked in. That is not gonna work for SSI. We all know that, right? That's the very reason we're here in this room. So interoperability at layer two is absolutely paramount. What you need to be able to do is choose any wallet from any vendor in the world and be able to put any credential from an issuer in there and have any verifier be able to accept it, okay? And for wallets to be able to talk to each other, if I have a different wallet on every one of my devices, like all of the secure messaging apps we use every day, then they should all be able to talk to each other. We're a ways from that right now. We're working on it. So what we highlight here right now is that, that um, at least two communities come together, the diff community and the hyperledger community to say, let's interoperate on a protocol called DIDCOM. There's another group, um, Digital Bazaar has been leading, it's been working on something called the uh, Credential Handler API or CHAPI. And uh, I'm trying to think, There's are there any other layer two protocol? Yeah. In the end, this, 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 you know, this is sort of the hard part we're working on. Now, again, DIDCOM, right now what, uh, what's happened there, again, just since uh, IW last fall, is that the Hyperledger Aries community and the DIFF community came together and said, let's have a single working group, work on that. It's, and every time that happens, it doesn't just double, right? What happens is then a bunch more people go in and go, that's the center of gravity. So there's, there's, there's at least, I'd say, 40 active developers now working on, on that work there. All right, so that's the first two layers. And what I like to stress about those is, you put those first two layers together and what you've achieved is cryptographic trust. The machines trust the machines and can verify that all the crypto works, right? That you've got a, a, a verifiable did and did document down here and that you've, you've formed a secure connection between those two machines. But we're basically at the same level of trust you have between IP addresses on the internet you still don't know who's on the other side of that connection, okay? This is why we need to layer in human trust. That's where the trust triangle comes in. Because now you have that secure private connection in either direction, the two parties can request the verifiable credentials they need from the other party and see what uh, trust networks or circles of trust uh, um, overlap such that they can develop a trust relationship. Does that make sense? See, see, see where we're going with it? That's, this is where we get, uh, you know, why the human trust component is so important <laughs> and why the stack that we're building here does not rely on technology alone, okay? And <clears throat> the really, really incredible news there is the standard for that layer for interoperable verifiable credentials is already done, at least the 1.0 version. And Christopher, you were a member of the, of the group from the very outset, right? It was not easy, but we got to a standard that there are a couple different formats of those credentials, so we still have some interoperability challenges there. But to be all the way to a W3C recommendation there, that's a, a full standard last, as of last November, is a huge step forward. And in terms of momentum of, of SSI, that has, boy, after that came out, suddenly we did a huge uptick. In, in you know, folks like major vendors and major uh, financial institutions, governments all saying, okay, let's really start talking about how this can work. <clears throat> all right, the last layer in the stack here is governance, right? I've already made the point, if you don't have that piece, you're not all the way to production. What Evernim's seeing, and, and to Oscar's and the, the original question here, how do we get from here to there? We start focusing on that piece, and making sure that it's dealt with when the technology is ready so that you have a full, something that's ready to go all the way to production. Now, I have one last point to make about, about that, which is once we had the stack, as I said, about a year ago, and we began you know, really socializing what, it was gonna, uh, what was gonna be necessary, and um, what we found was 
governance actually applies at every layer. So John Jordan of BC Gov came up with this term, uh, the trust over IP stack, based on the, the concept of both TCP IP being the thing that once we standardized on it and got it out there in open source software that was interoperable, we had the internet. It took off, okay? <clears throat> but the other part was, now we want to do something over the internet that's something we do in the offline world and we just want to do it online. It was voice. That's where the term voice over IP came from. His point was, now we want to do trust. We want to do this online. And so he came up with that term for the stack because he said, that stack is a dual stack. It's exactly what we just went over from a technology perspective, but the other half is governance frameworks at all levels. <coughs> governance framework for your network. We spent all morning here talking about that. There's, this is a lot of the European SSI initiatives start with that piece. Okay, we gotta, we gotta have confidence in the underlying blockchain network where we'll be rooting public DIDs. You need confidence the next level. You need to know that wallets and agents out there actually meet the security and privacy standards, right? So that verify, the issuers can say, I'm confident issuing to your wallet, and verifiers saying, I'm confident in you presenting from your wallet. We call those provider governance frameworks. Now, the ones we've already talked about before, and the ones where I think we will see tens of thousands of these over time are credential governance frameworks, right? That's really the heart of it. What is the definition of credential? Who can issue it? What are the policies so that verifiers know what they're relying on? And at the very top layer, we've got what we call metasystem or ecosystem governance frameworks. They're really designed to be umbrellas for whole families or ecosystems of governance frameworks. So that you can have interoperability at the level, the best example I could give to you last week uh, at Identity North, Pan-Canadian Trust Framework, if you're familiar with that, it is, I think, the leading example of a national trust framework or governance framework. And they are now adapting it to the stack. That's why they asked me to come and give this presentation that we spent, after I was done, the whole rest of the day talking about governance. So I'm so glad. And I did tell them right to the as I said, you know, you guys are ahead in, in digital identity overall, but in terms of recognizing SSI as infrastructure, the Europeans are ahead. I'm going over to talk to them next week. So I'm really glad you're here and, and able to, you know, to listen to this, uh, this, this whole talk. Um, <clears throat> I probably used up my time so I can finish here. I have a few slides I can talk about governance or we can bring them up later, but I think I've, I've gone to the limit of that time. So I hope this was helpful.